Do you want some bad news? Because we do have some bad news this week. As Mozilla announced a round of layoffs in their new strategy to refocus on Firefox and their core product. We also have India moving to ban ProtonMail in the whole country. But fortunately, we do also have some cool stuff like the Cosmic Desktop approaching its first alpha release, some cool Ubuntu-related things on the desktop, and some interesting gaming news. Now, what isn't gaming-related, though, is this message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare. They're your all-in-one service provider if you run a Linux server or workstation fleet, and you want to keep it secure, up-to-date, and with minimum downtime thanks to kernel live patching and extended support for end-of-life distributions like CentOS 7, for example. In June 2024, any system running CentOS 7 will be left without official patches or support. Organizations are now confronted with the critical need to migrate their server fleets to a new Linux distribution, and they don't have a direct upgrade path. And for this transition, you really need more time and more expertise to evaluate all the alternatives and to execute a good migration strategy. So Tuxcare introduces its extended lifecycle support for CentOS 7. It enables you to not only keep using your existing setup for as long as you need, but also to get access to seasoned Linux architects who will help you with your migration and ensure a seamless transition when you're ready. The service provides a lot of flexibility, offering up to five years of security patches, including for more than 60 high and critical vulnerabilities that CentOS themselves didn't fix, or a complete coverage with a 14-day security patch SLA, alongside comprehensive technical support and migration guidance. And all for just $6.45 per month per system. So click the link in the description below and get some time to prepare your migration and know that you will be ready and you'll have some help when the time actually comes to change to something new. So, Mozilla announced that they would reduce their workforce as they scale back development on certain products. As a result, 60 employees will lose their job, which is around 5% of Mozilla's workforce. Projects affected by this are Mozilla Monitor Plus, the very recently announced paid service to remove personal data from leaks, but also Mozilla VPN, Firefox Relay, and other privacy-focused services. The general impression at Mozilla seems to be that these aren't really offering anything too different or interesting compared to competitors, and thus these services are struggling to grow. The Mozilla.social instance on Mastodon will also see reduced investment, but it will stay online. Now, these cuts are made to better concentrate on Firefox, especially on the mobile app where they feel they can grow the most. And apparently AI hasn't been abandoned as I thought, since an internal memo apparently told employees that Mozilla wants to bring trustworthy AI into Firefox, and that they're merging their AI team with their content team and the Pocket team. And it's hard not to see the new CEO at work here. It always sucks when talented contributors to open source projects lose their job. So I really do hope that they'll find something that is suited to their skills and to what they actually want to do. As per the focus on Firefox at Mozilla, I think that's what basically everyone wants to see from the nonprofit. And if they have to add some AI stuff, I hope it is at least what they talked about already, which is a local only helper for your own research and not an all encompassing black box that lives in the cloud and just siphons your personal data. And we're getting very close to a cosmic desktop alpha now. In a blog post published yesterday, System76 talked about their progress, and they've now completed the screenshot tool for the desktop. It supports capturing the whole screen, a window or a screen area. They've also implemented window stacks for floating windows, letting you drag windows on top of one another and group them in tabbed groups, like what you would find on many tiling window managers, but for floating windows. And they've also designed their own screen display elements, which will show up when you increase or decrease the volume, the brightness, when you disable the touchpad or enable airplane mode. They also added maximize and unmaximize animation. They finalized the display settings and the wallpaper settings, and what they want to focus on now, before the alpha, is having good support for hybrid graphics, letting you see which apps use the dedicated GPU and shut them down if you want to save battery life. Other remaining areas include improving the terminal with a split window mode, doing the same for the text editor, 
finishing the tiling applet with per workspace auto tiling, designing the app and applet icons to start working on the file manager for Cosmic and a few other things. Cosmic will be shipped in Pop! OS 24.04 based on, you guessed it, Ubuntu 24.04 LTS. It is pretty solid progress here and I guess it also confirms that they will have their own file manager and they won't use something else like Nemo or Nautilus or Dolphin or whatever. So at least the core apps for Cosmic will all be very cohesive and look the same. Now, how they will handle apps designed for GNOME or for KDE remains to be seen, but I'm very excited to start testing the alpha when it releases. I think it's in early March. Now, the IT Ministry of India decided to issue an order to block Proton Mail in the country. 13 private schools received fake bomb threats that were hoaxes, and these threats were sent from Proton Mail. So, apparently, the only logical reaction from the government was to block the entire service. The order hasn't been sent yet, but it is bound to happen soon. Although, it is unclear if the mobile apps will be blocked from Apple's App Store and Google Play. For now, only the website seems targeted. Proton acknowledged that they received notice for that potential block, and obviously they are not amused. They're saying that it's misguided and inappropriate because it won't block anyone from sending threats from another email address, and it won't even be any use if the people who send these threats were not located in India. Now, the block is made possible by a relatively recent law that lets a committee decide to block anything they would like in the whole country for national security reasons. The committee noted that getting information about the people using Proton Mail has been an issue because, well, it's encrypted and they can't give you the contents of the email or the personal info of the user. So it does feel more like an attempt to remove a tool that India cannot spy on or monitor or control than a real justified reaction. So congratulations to the absolute bastards who thought it was funny to send bomb threats to various schools of all things. But also, would India have blocked Gmail, for example, assuming Gmail is as popular in India as it is in the rest of the world? Because it doesn't feel like they would have done that and would have paralyzed millions of people and companies. So it does feel like an opportunistic way to get rid of a service that they can't actually control and they just found the right justification to do it. Now, the Servo project is being picked back up again. Servo was an experimental browser engine meant to replace Gecko, the long-standing Firefox engine. It was developed by Mozilla, it uses Rust, and it was pretty much abandoned by the non-profit. They did use some of these features inside of Gecko, but the whole engine was pretty much ditched. But it looks like at FOSDEM it was mentioned that the project is being restarted. However, it's not being restarted by Mozilla, it's the team at Igalia that decided to reboot it. Still, the project now has an updated roadmap for 2024, which hopefully might result in the engine being adopted by some browsers in the future. And it might not result in anything, maybe no browser will decide to use it, but I think it's an opportunity to bring more diversity into the browser engine space, because having just Blink, controlled by Google, is an absolute nightmare for the open web and how websites can be designed, what features they can pick. It's just not good. So hopefully Servo will land in Firefox, maybe in some Linux-only browsers, who knows, but I really hope it results in something good. And still on the topic of browsers, Chromium will integrate the web monetization API in the browser base, and it will make its way into Chrome 127 in July. This thing is a new API that lets websites declare that they accept micropayments from their audience, and people using a web browser can now automatically contribute a teeny tiny amount of money when they visit a specific website. For example, I could enable web monetization on my website if I ever decided to write something there, and you could say, hey, every time I visit this website, I agree to donate one cent. And then every time you visit my website and you read a page or watch a video, you automatically transfer one cent from your wallet to mine. It's obviously all voluntary and the user decides how much each micropayment is, it's not up to the website to set a minimum. Users also decide the frequency of the payments for every website that they want to support. And it does look like a very solid idea, especially since it's hitting Chromium, meaning that about 90% of the browser market share will have access to that feature. Now, if it's not too buried in the settings, 
it does have the potential to make the ad-based internet less relevant and let people make a living from micro donations from their audience. So yeah, it's I think it's a good thing. And I, as a creator, am pretty excited to see how this thing will go. Now, Ubuntu will gain a new desktop security center in the future. This thing is a new app using Flutter, as with everything else Ubuntu develops, and it will expose a bunch of security-related settings that were previously either spread across many different tools and settings pages, or command line only. So it will support things like attaching a device to your Ubuntu Pro subscription, enabling kernel live patching, or managing system permissions for applications packaged as snaps. You will also be able to access encryption-related options for their future TPM-backed disk encryption, and you can get your encryption recovery keys from there. You'll also be able to manage the firewall and a few other things. Now, the tool is currently in very early stages of development, so even if you can already install it and try it, it is super early days. But I do like seeing Ubuntu regain control over the desktop experience that they provide. It sort of reminds me of the good old days when Ubuntu was the absolute best desktop distro. There was no discussion about it. I still don't like the snaps, but I like that they are trying to tweak GNOME and add their own spin on top of it. Much like what OpenSUSE would be doing with Yast, for example. And Ubuntu's installer will also get a little revamp in Ubuntu 24.04. Apparently, that new installer wasn't the best thing for OEMs. It wasn't really focused on provisioning, meaning it was harder to handle multiple installs with this tool or to let the user set up their account after the install was already done. Now, in 24.04, they will not fix all of that, but the installer will get a refresh. They will now show you accessibility options as the second step, right after you pick your language. And these settings will carry over into your final install. The keyboard layout selection also looks nicer now, just like the internet connection step of the installer or the install options, which also now look much better. Basically, every page got the same design with a visual or icon on the left and the options and settings on the right. And it all looks much more legible and engaging. All the other steps also received the same updated designs that aren't implemented just yet, including for using encryption, creating your user account or partitioning. And you might think, who cares, it's the installer, but actually it's the most important part of the whole experience because it's the first point of contact anyone will have with the distro. Replacing your OS or installing a new one or partitioning is extremely scary for a lot of people that have never done it before. So offering a very legible, very clear, well-designed and reassuring installer is absolutely crucial. So it's great to see that Ubuntu is actually doing that. And let's finish this with the gaming news. Now, the insanely talented developers of Azahi Linux have passed yet another milestone. Their support for OpenGL and OpenGL ES is now newer than what Apple offers themselves in macOS. The latest OpenGL driver for Apple Silicon on Linux now conforms with version 4.6, while Apple is stuck at 4.1, which is almost 14 years old. But this also means that now the team is going to be able to focus on Vulkan support, which will be very useful, especially for anything gaming related. They didn't give any specifics on how that work is moving along, apart from the fact that they are well on the road to supporting it. Now, as per M3 support, they said it will take at least six months to get basic support. In the meantime, the M1 and M2 platforms are almost completely supported, apart from Thunderbolt, Touch ID, the built-in mic, or using an external monitor over USB-C. And it is just insane to see a group of volunteers managing to beat Apple in terms of how good their drivers are without any documentation or any help. Like stellar work there. And finally, we have some more details about the Manjaro Orange Pi, that gaming handheld running Manjaro that was announced at FastDev. So first, it will not run the usual edition of Manjaro. It will be Manjaro Gaming Edition, which is an immutable distribution that comes with a heavy focus on Flatpak support, obviously, plus specific patches for GameScope, Open Gamepad UI, and more. It will also come with KDE for its desktop mode, similarly to SteamOS. The release date is planned for the second quarter of 2024, and the price has been described as being on the lower end of Steam Deck pricing, meaning around 400 to 500 euros, I guess, which isn't bad at all for the specs, since it comes with at least 16 gigs of RAM, 
512 gigs of SSD and a Ryzen 7 7840U. And if it manages to hit that price point, it's going to be a very interesting device, provided that the hardware is actually good and solid and feels nice. I think it's a great alternative to a Steam Deck because it feels on paper like it would be more powerful than the APU the Steam Deck has. It doesn't have the OLED screen, but it does have a pretty good resolution and it looks like the inputs are actually better on this thing than on the Steam Deck. So we'll have to wait for reviews to see if it's actually worth it or not, but on paper at least, it looks very cool. And speaking of very cool devices, how about those made by our sponsor, Tuxedo Computers? They are a Linux hardware manufacturer that makes laptops, desktops, and NUCs that run Linux out of the box. They pick the hardware specifically because it runs really well with Linux. And in their testing, if they encounter any issues, they upstream everything that they can, or they ship packages that you can install to have those drivers fixes. They have a big range of devices that should cover every need and every price point. Whether you need a laptop or a desktop, something like a workstation, something for gaming, something for office work, they have it all. All the devices have plenty of customization options, including for laptops, your own keyboard layout, and your own logo on the lid. And if you want to open or repair the devices, you can do that with all their laptops. You can change the battery, the RAM, the SSD, and sometimes even the wireless card. Tuxedo Computers is all I use nowadays. My laptop that I run the channel on is an Infinity Book Pro 16, and my gaming console running Holo ISO is a Tuxedo Cube. I don't use any computer from anyone else these days. So if you need a new computer and you want to support Linux's development, click the link in the description below and get yourself a Tuxedo device. They're really, really solid. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, well, you can always give it a thumbs down and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you want to help support the channel, I have plenty of links to do just that. If you become a Patreon supporter or YouTube member, you'll actually get a daily version of these Linux and open source news. So check that out. Thanks for watching. And I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.